Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure today to be able to introduce to you Min Jin Lee. Um, she was born in uh, Seoul, South Korea, uh, came to the U.S. in um, 1976, right, when she was seven years old, uh, grew up in Queens in New York, grew up in a, also in a family wholesale jewelry store, right, and worked, worked behind the counter and grew up in church. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about that and then about the the serious liver disease that she developed and how she persevered through all that and a lot of other things. So please join me in welcoming a National Book Award finalist, Min Jin Lee. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about, about growing up in, in Queens and, and suddenly being in this amazing place called America. Oh, well, first of all, Marvin, thank you so much for having oh. me here. I'm delighted to be a Patrick Henry. This is really quite a privilege to be considered a newsmaker. I had no <laughs> idea that, <laughs> that I was such a thing. So I guess when I first came to America, I was really surprised. I was really surprised because in Korea, I had read a, an enormous number of Western fairy tales. I read a lot of Korean fairy tales and a lot of Western fairy tales. And I was a very private little kid. I didn't talk hardly at all. I didn't talk really almost until middle school and high school when I came to America. It wasn't that I couldn't talk, but I wasn't really talking. So my whole world was really just books all the time. So when my parents said that we were going to go to America, I thought, oh, that's really interesting. You know, it's going to be this whole other world. And as soon as I land, I'm going to speak English. Like, I don't know exactly how that happened. It happens, I, though. I, I wasn't a smart kid, but I was, <laughs> I was thinking these things. And then I went to America, and we came to JFK, the airport, and I realized, oh my gosh, it looks exactly like Seoul, but was not Korean people. And I was really disappointed because I thought, oh, it's going to be kind of like Cinderella. There'd be stagecoaches and ball gowns and people wearing party dresses as if a fairy tale would occur in JFK, which did not. And then I thought, oh, it's just like there. <laughs> so that was a little disappointing. But then, of course, it was also wondrous because they had all these cool things that we didn't have in Korea when I was growing up, like peanut butter. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> I love peanut butter. <laughs> Amen. Then, Amen. Yes, right? Amen. I mean, hallelujah, peanut butter. And then also, one thing that was really expensive in Korea was bananas. Like, it was something really rare. And of course, at that moment in 1976 and before, you had these little tiny bananas from Jeju, which is a, a kind of like a little island off the coast of the southeastern coast of Korea. Very rare, very expensive, and we didn't have them at home. And my uncle, who, was, who we were staying with, Uncle John, he knew that bananas were quite dear in Korea. So as soon as we got there, he bought us this <laughs> enormous tub filled with bananas, which of course now I know is like the ch cheapest fruit they can possibly get. <laughs> and he just said, eat as many as you like. And I remember thinking, <laughs> What a great country. <laughs> you can have as many bananas as you like, and peanut butter, too. Now, I must ask about the exquisite pairing for sophisticated tastes, right. peanut butter and banana. Couldn't get any better. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, Don't you feel sorry for people who have allergies because they're thinking, like, you're missing out on something really valuable. Oh, and then some people, they, you know, they read or they dream about pairings with certain foods and certain wines, but they don't understand the best pairing of all of peanut butter and banana. Yes, so, absolutely. Anyway, moving, moving right along then. Uh, into literature. Uh, into, yes. into, into literature. Now, were you one of these kids who sort of started scrawling and writing a lot and, and writing stories? No, no, yeah. not at all. I never thought I was going to be a writer. Okay. I was a reader. And I, even now, I really see myself as a reader. I'm a very good reader. I can read very quickly. I could read very thoroughly. I could understand plot. I can tell you exactly what happened. I'm very good at recalling characters' names. But I didn't see myself as a writer. I didn't think that people like me became writers. I come from a working class background. Also, as a Korean American, there were no, there were no Korean American authors that I knew of when I was growing up. And even when I was in college, when I started to write stories, I think I was 20. So it wasn't like I had this early start. But I had a very early start in reading. So I'm probably better read than most people at age 20. So that was a huge advantage. So I kind of knew what a story should look, should look like, but I didn't think of myself as a writer, and I wasn't writing stories. Like, lately, if you talk to kindergarten kids, 
they'll come home and they'll say things like, I published a story today, and uh -huh. they'll show you, you know, two, four pieces of paper folded together with a staple, and right. they kind of hand it to you, and they're like, I'm an author, and I'm going, yes, you are. <laughs> so I, I didn't have that education of that kind of liberating feeling that you can kind of make a book at age uh -huh. four. I right. didn't have that. Okay, so you're going to Yale, you're majoring in history. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, why Yale? Oh, I went to Yale because, I, well, I got in. Yeah. I was so lucky. And then, and I didn't Do you, do you really was, think you were so lucky? Is it luck? Oh, my gosh. Oh, absolutely. Because I went to Bronx Science. And in my graduating class of 760 kids, three kids got in. Yeah. So I felt really, really lucky to yeah. have gotten in. I applied early, and I got deferred. And then I got in regular. Like, okay. I guess I got in April or something. And even then, I was thinking, oh, but I wanted to go because my favorite writer went there, Sinclair Lewis. Okay. All so right. if Sinclair Lewis had not gone to Yale, I would not have applied. Totally true. Okay, you won a couple of writing awards at Yale. Yes, how, how did, by a fluke. Okay, well, first of all, you had never been a writer. No. What, what, what led you to, you're sitting, you're sitting in, in Trumbull College yes. at Yale, <laughs> and you say one day, oh, I'm going to write something? Or how did, how did that happen? I took... Two writing classes. Okay. One, because I was, I got into this advanced level seminar and was on literary nonfiction with this really wonderful teacher, Fred Streeby. And I was not the brightest kid in the class. As a matter of fact, it was embarrassing because very often my socioeconomic class revealed itself very quickly. There were all these things that I didn't know. So, for example, we ha you were sitting in this really big oval table with all these other kids who are writers, and I'm the rube in the room. <laughs> and I was also the only non-white person in the room because it was an advanced class, and I, and I think I had to submit something, and that's how I got in. And one day we were talking about, um, we're critiquing a story, so everybody gets copies of the stories that you had written, and then I was reading this one story written by some kid, and she had mentioned Stonehenge. And I said, I raised my hand like an idiot, and I said, oh, Stonehenge, I don't know what that is. Maybe you should define what that is for the reader who doesn't know. And all the kids turned around and looked at me like, <laughs> did you just crawl out of a cave? Like, are you stupid or something? Because a lot of those kids had gone to Stonehenge. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, right, I'm from Queens. They don't have Stonehenge in Queens. <laughs> Right. And also, this is before Google Images, where now, like, if I don't know something, I can just kind of go, okay, that's what it looks like. Like, I could look up what Percival, Virginia looks like immediately before I get here. Back then, I really couldn't do those things. So yeah. people would know right away if you hadn't had that experience. So that class, I did feel intimidated, but I wrote a story in that class, and I submitted it, and it turned out that it won the best nonfiction writing of the college. What was it about? Oh, it was actually about my mother. Okay. It was about my mother, and it was about just growing up and uh, all the questions that I had about what it means to be a mother like my mother, who had just endured so many things about coming to America. So it was personal, but it was blind admission, so you didn't put your name down. So I, I remember just sort of submitting it, and then it won this thing, and I was like, that's kind of cool. Right. Maybe I'll do that again. <laughs> so then I took a fiction class. And then I wrote a story based on a newspaper article that my teacher just happened to hand me. She cut out a little tiny article from the New York Times where four little girls had attempted suicide because they were so poor. And they did it in order to make sure that their younger brother had money for school fees. And she gave me this little piece of news. And she goes, why don't you write something about it? So I did. And then I submitted that and it won a prize. Okay, so two for two. Two, two. for two, I know. Okay. And still, I was like, I'm going to go to law school because that's a real job. <laughs> so so were, you, were your real choices, with your, as far as your parents were concerned, law school or medical school? Well, I'm not bright enough for medical school. But like, they, I, but I they wanted to have a lawyer or a doctor. Did you feel parental pressure there? Or? No, not at all. No. Okay. My parents aren't really like that. My mother is an artist. She's a piano teacher. Okay. And my father is a business person. I mean, you know, he had this little tiny store. I think they definitely wanted me to have a job. And... I don't blame my parents in any way about this because I didn't think I could make a living as a writer. And even now, it's really hard to make a living as a writer. And I'm almost 50. And I'm considered a successful writer. <laughs> and it's really hard. Like, I was just turned down for two teaching positions. I, I didn't get four fellowships this year. 
Um, that what, was what right you, after the National Book Award. Where, yeah, you, you have your National Book Award finalist. What is it? What does it take to get? I have a, no idea. Oh, okay. But I did get two fellowships. So, okay. so I applied for eight things. I didn't get six things. And I got two things. Okay. So I, I'm not two for two anymore. No, Mar but two Marvin. for six, three thirty-three will make you an American League batting champion. <laughs> right. and the thing is, the truth is, I only needed to have one, so I got right. two. So it's like it's good. Okay. Okay. So uh, you graduate from from Yale. You're going to Georgetown Law School. Mm -hmm. And did you want to be a lawyer? I like school. So if you sent me to plumbing school, I'm good. Okay. Like, I really like learning, and I also like doing stuff with my hands. So when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a carpenter. Like, I thought it would be so cool to make furniture. Uh -huh. And then I realized, no, I don't think I can really, like, lift all those things. So then I thought, I'll be an architect. But in my mind, it was not about being a writer. Okay. So then you become a corporate law person. Yes. With lots of billable hours. Yes. And I was really good. How, yeah. how many hours did you did you accumulate? The the month that I quit, I billed three hundred hours. And if you're an honest person, yeah. you're actually in the office about three hundred and fifty to three hundred and sixty. Okay. So I would be there every single day, and the only time I would leave is I'd literally go to church on Sunday and I come right back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, what really made you decide no more law? Was there a certain breaking point you had when in your 300-hour month, or did you... Yeah, did... it was exactly that. Okay, okay. This so, is not a life, basically, or... No, actually, I have no idea how in the world those words came out of my mouth, I quit, because I am not an I quit person. But after the 300 hours, I finished this task, and I was a baby lawyer, and I was a very good baby lawyer because I'm really compliant. So if you tell me, Minjin, read 12 boxes of documents, I'll be like, okay, and I'll sit there and I'll read every page, and then I'll write the due diligence report, and I'll go to my partner and go, look, <laughs> and I'll show them the smoking documents, and my clients will save a lot of money, and they bill me, they, they probably billed me out at like $300 an hour. So if you think about it, it's like a lot of money that I was generating. I wasn't paid that, but right. for my firm. Anyway, so after I finished billing 300 hours one month, I went to the partner and I, you know, gave my final task and I was kind of thinking, they're going to tell me to go home, to rest or something. In fact, I just got another assignment. I was put on another matter, or that's what it's called, like all the different deals are called matters. And I would always have so many different matters because I was this really good little grunt. And I actually just said to him, I quit. I, I can't. Actually, those words, I quit. I quit. I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think they were surprised. I was surprised <laughs> because it wasn't like this rehearsed speech. So, and then, and then I left. Like, and, and once I said it, I, I knew I wouldn't go back. It wasn't something, it was an irrevocable stance. And I right. knew that once I had said those words, it was done. And then I packed up and I went home. Now, you're married at this point, right? Yes. Re recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and you go home planning to write. You, you thought you, had, you, had one, you were two for two in writing awards competition. So that was your plan to write. And we also interested then in, in, in having children, right? Or no, no. Not at that point. I, I wasn't no. thinking about having kids. Okay. Like, I didn't, when I was growing up, I didn't want to get married and I didn't want to have children. Okay. The fact that it has happened to me is really quite a marvel. So I think people often think that I have these really smart plans. I do not have a lot of smart plans. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I have made so many stupid plans. And I think that's probably the reason why I, at age almost 50, I have two books. And last year I almost didn't have health insurance because I think I did make a lot of mistakes. But I got married at 24 because my husband asked me to and I thought he was really attractive. It was not like this well-reasoned you know, thought because he's somebody that I met when I was 22 and he was really nice. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll get married. you know. <laughs> and then it worked out. I mean, it's gonna be our 25th anniversary this year. <laughs> and then as for having the kid, I really wouldn't have had kids except for the fact that my husband was such a nice person and he was very, he's very principled, like very, He's a very thoughtful, principled person. I thought, well, he's more patient than I am. Maybe this could work. So I had a child when I was 29, which is not like young to have kids. And I was only convinced only because he was a good example of a father. And you found you liked being a mother. 
oh, I love being a mom, but it's really humbling. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. It makes novel writing look like a joke. Yeah. And <clears throat> tell us now about, about the health situation involving your liver. Oh, so when I was 16, I gave blood to the Red Cross for a blood drive. And they wrote me a letter saying that you cannot give blood anymore because you're a hepatitis B chronic carrier. So I was an asymptomatic chronic carrier. And I didn't know what that meant really because I, I felt fine. And then I went to college and then one break, like it was either winter break or spring break, I came home and I couldn't get out of bed. And it turned out that I had become symptomatic and I literally had hepatitis. And then I learned from the doctors at Yale New Haven Hospital that it was very serious and that I, would likely to get, I was likely to get liver cancer in my 20s and 30s. I did not get liver cancer. However, I knew that I had this tendency to go from being well to not being well, depending upon the stress situation. So I know that for a fact, I think what gave me courage to stay away from the law is because I was working far too much. And I thought being a writer would be a lot easier. Okay. So you've, you've left law school. Uh, suddenly you're, you're operating on one income rather than two in New York yeah. City, a very expensive place to live. And then along with the health problems, there are also financial problems from involving your parents, right? Not my parents. Not your parents, no. but other, other relatives. Other relatives. That you felt responsible. For, and, and we are res I'm, I'm still yeah. responsible still for responsible. These, these other relatives. And, and so this is, where, where's the money going to come from? I mean, is this what's going through your head at this point? Or? It's still going through my head. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, money problems are always at the door. It just really depends on how your expenditures are. So I'm very mindful of the way we live our lives. And, you know, I made this decision to be a writer. Like, I could have stayed being a lawyer. We could have had a lot more money. But at the same time, I feel like the work that I produce is something that's important to me. And I was really worried about it last year because my husband lost his job last year. But then he, ha he got a job in October. So we're fine. We have health insurance again, which is huge. And then... In terms of this year, I got funding for this big fellowship, so I feel again like, oh, I guess I should be writing this third book because I've never been fully funded before. It's always been kind of like whenever I can figure things out, I would write. And it feels like this real privilege to have somebody, these two fellowships actually believing in my future. Okay, so with, with the liver problems, your energy is really sapped at this yeah. time. And but now I'm totally well. Okay, so now so. you now you have. But back back then, I, I remember, and I, I found this actually very moving that you you said you only had uh, maybe a couple of hours of energy a day, and you wanted oh, to I save those for, for Sam. Yes. So when my son was three, three, and from the moment that I delivered my son until he was about three, my energy level was really terrible, and also I was having these very strange problems where I had um, inflammation in both my wrists. So I couldn't hold this. And if I was going up the stairs, my tendons would really hurt. So they initially thought I had some sort of autoimmune disease. And then, and then I, they thought that I had bilateral decurvanes tenosynovitis, which is kind of inflammation in your wrist. So I even had surgery. And then it turned out that it wasn't those things. It was all relating to the fact that my liver had cirrhosis. And they couldn't figure this out until I had all these other systemic problems. And then once I had the liver cirrhosis, my doctor really felt that I should do this experimental treatment with interferon B, and I did it for six months, and I became cured, and it was like a miracle. And even now, it's quite miraculous that it occurred, because so many people haven't been cured. So, uh, I mean, you, uh, you grew up and you were going to a Presbyterian church. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, all these things are happening to you. Yeah. Uh, are you, are you starting, and, and you, you have cirrhosis of the liver without ever drinking, right? I mean, which no. is, and so. I still don't drink. Yeah, and so, and so do you, do you, are you. Are, I can act drunk though, Marvin. <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about that a little later here. Just um, thought I should share that with you. Oh, it's good, it's good, like, it's good to know. <laughs> So most people who are drunk want to think about acting sober, but you No, 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 I can do the exact opposite. Because okay. no, I'm always the sober one everywhere. Okay. Okay. So I'm paying attention very carefully. So if people are drunk around me, I just want you to know, like, I'm a vault, but I'm also Xerox. Like, I can remember everything. Okay. So health problems, financial problems, despite being two for two in college, <laughs> right. you, write a, you write a first novel and it's turned down. 
I read, you write a second yes. novel and you, and you decide it's no good. It's terrible, yeah. And so, okay, again, financial problems, health problems. You only have two hours of energy a day and you're devoting that to Sam rather yeah. than to your writing. Mm -hmm. uh, are you starting to say at this point, well, why, why me, Lord? I think that I'm the kind of gal who says, why me, Lord, all the time. Like, I'm not very... I guess I'm not very... I guess I'm not a very good person. <laughs> I mean, I always feel kind of like whiny in my head. I always feel irritated join at the, everything. Join the club. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I complain a lot in my head. I, I try really hard not to share it with other people, but I have this kind of like, ah. Oh! And then when I read the newspapers, I'm always angry because there's such, there's such horrible things are happening all the time. And I know that we're all pretty horrible, but... Yeah, there's definitely a sense of why me, yeah. And why now, or why not now? And so, okay, so let's say you're, you, are, you are Jacob wrestling with God, and you, you yeah. wrestle a lot, and then what happens? Do you... I lose every time, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the problem, because it's, it's, if you believe it's God, capital G, it's not an equal relationship. <laughs> so, but I think what's really funny for me, because I was churched my entire life, my grandfather was a minister, is that I do feel the sense of personal relationship where God is, you, you know, this is very funny. Most people think God's really angry. I think of God as being very humored. Like, I think he's a very funny guy. I always think God is very humored by us and tolerates us, kind of like the way we look at, like, like puppies trying to move furniture. Like, that's kind of the way I think God looks at us. It's like, isn't that cute? <laughs> that puppy cannot move that sofa. <laughs> and we the had, puppy's really mad at the sofa. Isn't that adorable? Like, I, I feel like that's who God is to me. A bit. We had, we had a three-year-old who was uh, trying out his strength and carried a, a, uh, a bucket of paint, essentially, you know, <laughs> all the way across the room, a carpet, leaving a trail behind. But I was, it was very impressive that he, right. that he did that. And, right. and so this is how God looks at it. Oh, right. this is cute. It's a cute pet trick in right. some ways. And also, like, with the paint is ruining everything. Yeah. But it's... <laughs> yeah. So, um, but you still believe. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, like, I've made a decision. It's kind of like, for me, it, this is it. Yeah. And you're not going to say... I'm I, in it. You don't say I quit, basically. Cause, no. Because no. God doesn't quit on us. I am convinced. I feel very convinced for me that this is what I believe. And you're reading Hosea now. No, I'm always reading the Bible. And Hosea is a chapter, a book that I really admire because it's so troubling. It's such a troubling book in the Bible. God tells Hosea, marry the prostitute. Yes. You know, God tells Hosea, a perfectly nice guy, go marry the town slut. I mean, that's pretty much what it is. I mean, we shouldn't use that word, but she's not... She's very promiscuous, which would be a difficult person to marry. Like, who would want to marry somebody who's very promiscuous? So, and he's got to do it, and he knows that she's going to hurt his feelings. And God says, that, I want you to do it, Hosea, because I want you to know what it's like when you cheat on me. And I always thought, wow, what an interesting thing. What an interesting idea. And it's troubling. It's very, very troubling. So I like that book. It's a weird book. It's very, very short. You can read it in like 30 minutes. So God composes very interesting stories. I mean, I always think about God being a writer because the word is so important. And whenever I'm in this whole publishing world, I kind of think, well, God is a writer and he's a publisher and he kind of gets it. <laughs> he's an editor. <laughs> he's all those things. I wonder what God thinks about my little troubles. Like, I, I hope that he can, I don't know, give me a, give me a break. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just continuing with perseverance for a moment. Mm. Uh, with all these things are going on. Uh, for a time, you really can't write because your, your small no. amount of energy is, is devoted to Sam. And, but then you get better, and you're able to write. And still, at that point, the, the path is still not, there's not still a glorious glow. You're still struggling. No. You're trying to get published. I'm still struggling, Marvin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. Like, writing is really hard. This, it's not a, you know what I always tell my fiction students whenever I have fiction students or whenever earnest fiction writers come to my readings and they go, what do I do? How do I get published? And I always say, forget that it's a career. Don't think of it as a profession. Don't think of it as a job. It's work. It's a vocation. It's really, really difficult, but earn a living somehow, somewhere else because this is not how you're going to make it. I mean, I know very successful writers, and they don't make money from selling their books. So you do it because you love it, 
but don't do it because you think it's going to deliver something in your life. As a matter of fact, I recently said this. It's not redemption. Your book is not redemption. It will not redeem all the pain and suffering in your life. It's something that you make because you feel called to write that story. And if you don't feel called to write that story, don't write it. Okay, do something well, else. But when you look back Take a at it. Yeah, when you when you look back at these at these two I'll, I'll say I mean two terrific novels you've done, Free Food for oh, Millionaires and Pachinko, don't you think oh, yeah, it's worthwhile? With all the struggles? I do. I'm I'm very proud of my work. I am. I'm proud of my work. And one of the things that's really cool about the Bible that I always thought was really cool about the Old Testament is when he talks about certain craftsmen, people like Bezalel, or I think it's Aholiab. Like There are certain people in the Bible in the Old Testament who are called to make parts of the temple, right? right? Cause, right. Or they know how to craft things. And I always think, you know, I like the idea of being a craftsperson. Like, I don't think of myself as this big intellectual, this big artist. I think, you know, I want to make something really beautiful. I want it to shimmer. I want it to stand the test of time. That's who I really see myself as. But do I think it's really worth all that? I'm not sure. I'm really not sure because, I mean, I, I got to tell you, last year was really not pretty. And that was considered my best year. <laughs> so I don't know. I feel really humbled by the fact that I get to do this. But I hope that I get to continue to do this because it, it does take all this time. So when did the National Book Award uh, finalist uh, status come to you? I mean, is, is it this point where your, your husband is unemployed, you don't have health insurance? That's right. And then? It came. It came. How, Isn't does, that it, crazy? how, does, how does it come? A telephone call? Uh, email? No, I found out about the long list, which is when, you, right. when the fiction gets narrowed down to 10 books. Okay. That was on Twitter. Okay. I found out on Twitter. Twitter. Okay. And then when you get to five, the finalists, the executive director phones you. Okay. And I remember when Lisa Lucas called, I just started to sob because I was like, oh my goodness. And at that point, Christopher had just gotten another job in Boston. Okay. And I was like, wow, two for two. That's awesome. Okay. Um, tell us about, about uh, Pachinko mm -hmm. uh, and, and why, why that was so meaningful to you. I mean, why, how, when, when, when he had a job, when your husband had a job in Japan, I mean, you were able to interview lots of people. So you really worked at it, again, like a, like a carpenter. And, but you kept at that. Why? Because this novel is really about what it means to have a home. It mean, it's also a book about parenting, what it means to be a true father. Who is a true father? Is it biological or is it the adoption experience? What does it mean to be a parent? Like as a mother, as a, and also what does it mean to be a child? Like all those things are happening. But the big reason why I started this story is why do people hate I really wanted to understand how children could hate other children because that is how I learned about this story. Like I didn't know about the Korean Japanese until I was in college. And when I was in college, I attended a talk where an American missionary who works with the Japanese Korean Japanese population in Japan came and gave a talk and I went because the university chaplain had asked me to go and I was like, all right, Harry, I guess I'll go. And it was me and another student who came. So it was the missionary the organizer, <laughs> and two students. So I couldn't leave. And he talked about all these Korean-Japanese historical aspects. And I was like, that's kind of interesting, and it's too bad that the Koreans were treated as second-class citizens, blah, 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 whatever. And then he told a story about a 13-year-old boy in his parish who was Korean-Japanese, who had climbed up to his apartment building, and he jumped off to his death. And his parents, who are also Korean Japanese, who are also born in Japan, were devastated. And they went through all of his things. They found his middle school yearbook because a boy had just graduated. And in the middle school yearbook, his Japanese classmates had written, go back to where you belong. I hate you. You smell like kimchi. And they wrote the words, die, die, die. And that story is the reason why I started this trajectory of trying to understand the Korean Japanese history and then to write a novel. The first novel that I wrote in 1996 to 2003 was called Motherland about this story. Mm. I, it was just terrible. It was a terrible book. It was really boring, very self-righteous, very angry. And I think it's because I was too close to this idea. And then when I went back to Japan, went to Japan for the first time to live there from 2007 until 2011, 
I met all these Korean Japanese people, and they were not victims. They weren't people who felt bullied. Mm. They were so interesting and so full of love. And I thought, oh, maybe the question of hatred isn't more hatred. It's actually responding in love. And how do you become that person? And then I realized it doesn't, it's not like an overnight thing. It's actually an enormous trajectory of time. And then so I put aside the first book that I wrote, Motherland. I saved one chapter, and then the rest of it I had to write again. Well, was Motherland also bad because, in a way, you hadn't, you hadn't done the research? No, I had done the research. You're no, done the, the research was perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. It was not a novel. It was a kind of treatise. Okay, so, it was, so it was, the research was perfect for a treatise, yes. but not for a novel. But it I wasn't think. an academic treatise gotcha. because I had all this fictional stuff in it. So it was kind of like a bad everything. Okay. Um, we'll go to your questions in a moment, and then I'll have some more. But let me just ask you this. The, uh, uh, you write, at, at the beginning when you started writing, you had difficulty doing it, and then you read that Willa Cather yes. had done a particular thing, and you did that thing, and it made a difference. So tell us about that. Oh, so <laughs> I quit being a lawyer in 95, and every morning I would go to this desk, this little desk that my sister had bought me because she wanted me to be a writer. So she ordered... Um, from the Levenger catalog. Okay. <laughs> she bought me a desk. It's like $400. I still have it because I'm so grateful that she believed in me. Ah. And I would go to my Levenger desk and I would feel like, okay, I'm a writer now, right? Not really. So then I would read the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Financial Times every day. And I would think, okay, inspiration's going to just come. Did not come. <laughs> and then I was just writing, I was writing every day, but it wasn't really good. And then one day I read that Willa Cather, a fiction writer I love, Apparently, she read a chapter of the Bible every single day before she began work. And I was like, I could do that. So I started to do that. And then later on, I started to read, I bought a study Bible. No, I'm sorry. That's not true. I was given a study Bible at my wedding by my mother's best friend from childhood. I was given an NIV study Bible. Great wedding gift. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think so at the time. Yeah. <laughs> To be honest, I was like, great, a Bible. You know, I, I wasn't this grateful person. I told you, there's something wrong with me. So I was like, I have this thing, and it's, you know, big enough, and it's got all the stuff in the bottom, the commentary. I was like, I'm going to read it. I have time. I don't have a job. So I would read the chapter, I would read the commentary, and I would read the chapter again. And then I would pull a verse that troubled me. Sometimes I would pull a verse that consoled me. But most likely I'd be like, why is that in there? And I would write it down in a, like a notebook. And I've done that now from 95 until now. I've read the Bible, I don't know, five or six times, like a loop. And it's great because I think it is such a foundational, incredible work of art. Like the Bible is a beautiful work of art. And, and just a book of Genesis alone, I think, could definitely spawn thousands of novels. It is, the, it is the text which pretty much every great Western writer, classical writer, has turned to for story. So it has helped me to understand story better. And I feel really inspired by it. And now that I'm older and I have cataracts, I even bought the large print. So that was my big indulgence. Okay. And um, the first, remind me if, this, if I've gotten this wrong, the first... Uh, story you wrote, I mean, after several years of struggling, the story you wrote that got published and actually encouraged you at that point was the Missouri Review with a mm -hmm. story which starts out about a person who's reading a chapter every, every morning, right? Oh, no, that's actually a narrative, Access of Happiness. Okay. Yes, right. 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 But it, I, I do have a piece in the Missouri Review, which is the chapter that I saved for Pachinko, oh, so Pachinko. you're right. Okay. But in uh, Access of Happiness, which is one of my very few first-person stories, I had my main character do this thing because I thought it was so weird. Right. Because, I mean, in my world of writers in New York, nobody reads the Bible. Yeah. It's, it's like almost like saying, I don't know, I watch porn. It's like, it's like a, a weird thing that people think that you do. Yeah, yeah. Questions for any of you?
Hi, thank you for talking to us. Hi. Um, so I'm actually working through Pachinko. I am, uh, well, I don't want to say like what's happening because I don't want to spoil it, um, but I'm almost done. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you chose Pachinko as your title. What's your name? My name's Evie. So are you a student here? I am. I'm a junior. Oh, how's that going? Uh, it's going pretty well. My journalism professor is actually beside me, so <laughs> the best. <laughs> it's going really well. Yeah. It's going really well. I, I think Evie should get an A. <laughs> <laughs> how's that, Evie? <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you for reading the book. And secondly, your question's really great because my publisher always wants me to talk about it and I always forget. So I feel like maybe my publisher contacted you. <laughs> Did they contact you, Evie? <laughs> no, I'm teasing. So Pachinko is a $203 billion adult gambling game in Japan. It is twice the export revenues of the Japanese auto industry. So if you think about how important it is for the Japanese economy, you have to realize that it's, it has a lot of significance. It is also a business that is dominated by the Korean Japanese people. And the reason why that is, is because the Korean Japanese were not allowed to have other jobs. Even now, it's difficult for them to get hired for certain positions. So if you were a working class Korean Japanese person or a very poor immigrant and you wanted to become, let's say, aspire to be a postal worker, that option was not open to you. So if you were a male, most likely you went into the pachinko business or other like independently owned businesses. And if you're a female, most likely you went into the food industry, the yakiniku business. So that was something that I, I became aware of through all of my research. The reason why the book is titled Pachinko is because if you have gambled at all, you know that the house always wins. The, favors will, the, um, the odds will always favor the house. And one of the things I was trying to suggest is that life, in many ways, feels incredibly unfair to all of us. And very often we have to do things in which we know that it's rigged. Like, we don't have the right person to call. We don't have the right resources. Or we don't have the right look. Whatever it is, things may seem really unfair. And yet, we have to still play. And for me, I was really impressed with how the Korean Japanese people knew that there was structural inequities, legally allowing them to be dispossessed and discriminated against. And yet, they continue to have faith and they continue to play. And that was really quite remarkable. And consequently, the book is called Pachinko. Because I think Pachinko is a kind of metaphor for even you and me, when you get to live in a country like America, even in America, there are many things that are very unfair and yet we still have to continue. You know, but I've, I've watched pachinko players in Japan. I've also watched people in, in casinos in this country. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain almost zomb zombie zombification. Mm -hmm. I mean, so does that, when you look at that, is, is it sad? I mean, here, here are people, human beings, were created in God's image, and yet we're, we've turned ourselves into zombies in a way, just sort of, you know, hour after hour, we do, it, we, do, we do that not just with slot machines, but we do that with our cell phones today. Yeah. Like, we do this all the time. All the time. We're constantly turning into zombies. And there are people who are really interested in turning us into zombies. And we have to be very mindful that the tools that we have that are wonderful in technology don't become our masters. And that we don't become enslaved to these things. Like, I think games are lovely. I think that... The phone is lovely. I think the internet can be a lovely thing. A lot of these things are lovely and good, but then we become addicted to it, or they're also designed to be addictive. There are two things going on. Yeah. And sometimes, like, I mean, if, if I have difficulty self-regulating at the age of 49, like, I have, feel so sorry for the eight-year-old. Like, I don't think it's about him having more grit or having more self-control. I think, no, it's a, totally an unfair fight because these technologies are designed to be incredibly engrossing and immersive. Well, how do you fight that? Oh, my gosh. This is the hardest part about being a parent lately, I think, because I'm not a Luddite. I do think technology is great. At the same time, I think regulating is incredibly difficult. So I don't know, because you can't seal people off. Because yeah. at this point, you really cannot have any kind of job without understanding some aspect of technology. Yeah. Questions? 
Uh, lots of Christian aspiring writers, uh, they, they ask themselves, well, should I enter the Christian subculture, the submarket, you know, for Christian fiction, Christian movies, those kinds of things. Um, uh, from, I take it, you, you're not living in that world. Uh, so, no, I don't. So, right, so. Uh, what, I mean, most what, people are really surprised when I tell them I go to church, like, you? And I think, I wonder what I've done. <laughs> that would indicate, must be all my cursing. Yeah, yeah that's, that's probably it, sure. I promised Marvin that I would keep it clean today. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you, so, have, you haven't so far shot right? us worse. I have not dropped an F-bomb yet. Right, nor, nor, <laughs> <laughs> nor have you put on your drunk imitation. Right, yet. right. <laughs> Good. Well, yeah, that must make it a lot easier then in a lot of, a lot of, a lot of situations. Um, uh, so, uh, like, what, what do you think of that debate that often happens among, you know, Christian college students? You know, like, you know, sure. should, I, should I go into the subculture or should I try to make it in the, uh, you know, the mainstream world? Uh, you know, what should they know about this kind of thing? Well, you know, it's, I really like your question so much because it's so important. But at the same time, I wanted to say something really interesting, whereas if you feel very inclined to write science fiction, you have to write it. If you, if you feel inclined to write things that are very theologically explicit and you want to write it in that way, you have to write it. But in terms of trying to make it, I have no idea how you make it because most people who are writers who are quite successful, if they're fortunate enough, they can get teaching positions. So they're not making it either. So I think you have to write what feels really natural to you. So even if I tried really, really, really hard, I could not write James Patterson's novels. It's what he does. It's the, what he does well. Like if you're, and people keep thinking that what he does or what John Grisham does or Brad Melter, those things are easy. They're not easy. If they were easy, everybody would do them. So Brad Melter has to write Brad Melter's work, and only he can do it. Like J.K. Rowling can only write what she writes. I, you know, I think, you know, for example, like Graham Greene, Eudora Welty, Marilyn Robinson, they write literary, non, literary fiction, or they wrote because they passed away. It's what they felt called to write. Some people don't, I mean, how many people read The Hobbit and absolutely refuse to believe that Tolkien is Christian? It happens all the time. And I think, okay, well then, that's what's interesting about art. It can be perceived by many multiple audiences. I think it's a real privilege if you can have multiple audiences. At the same time, I do know that the Christian publishing market is a very big one. It's probably more lucrative than literary nonfiction. I mean, literary nonfiction, usually the first run, you're lucky if you sell 2,000 copies. So, <laughs> so go ahead. Once you make what you can make that only you can make, the market will be obvious to you because you'll see what you created. It's kind of like, I remember I had an editor once. She said to me, well, if you, were, if you were working in a bakery, what would you make? And I said, I would make wedding cakes. Like, I don't make cupcakes. I make wedding cakes. And it's obvious from what I make. It's like, it's always like this big thing. It's not for one person. <laughs> um, but at the same time, wedding cakes have a special market. Like, people don't want a wedding cake every day, right? So I know that about what I do. It's, it's going to be for, what is it, 100, 200 people? Um, maybe it might be smarter to make cupcakes. <laughs> Question over here. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate having Hi. you. Um, so kind of off that note, how then would you recommend aspiring authors specifically discover their voice? And what experiences helped you discover that voice? And specifically following up with you saying that authors have to find what they're called to write. So I, um, I'm not a very traditional fiction writer. Like, I don't really fit in with a lot of fiction writers who are contemporary right now because I don't work on voice. So I guess people would say I have a voice in my work, but it's something that I'm not really conscious of. The thing that I'm very, very conscious of are themes. So when I start working on something, and this is very, again, very non-traditional fiction writer behavior, and I think this might be because I was a history major and because I was a lawyer, I think in a very different way. And I've been told I think in a very masculine way. So, <laughs> but, um, but it, then again, I shouldn't make fun of that because 
so much of my education was originally intended for men, right? So in a way, maybe I do think in that vein, in a Western masculine tradition. So I, I'm not, I, I don't want to completely dismiss that comment because I've had it several times that I think in a very kind of logical, traditional way in the form of almost like writing a brief. So I'll start with the theme and then I'll do all of this research and then I'll create a thesis and then I do more research and then the characters come and then I write something and then I usually throw it away and then I write it again. Very indirect, very stupid way to work. I don't really recommend it. <laughs> But like, let's say if you took a fiction class, I assume that you are an undergraduate here? No, I'm an alumni. I'm oh, graduate here. okay, you look very young. <laughs> you should probably still get carded. So <laughs> if you took, took a writing class or if you were gonna write an assignment, you will, like, so if I said to you, okay, your name is? Javana. Javana, can you please write a story about love, put three characters in it, and I want you to write six pages, you have one day, please make it a terrible story. Like, that's pretty much, like if I was your teacher, that's what I would tell you, why? I, why do I tell you that it's a terrible story? Because I don't want you to worry about it. I just want you to be free. Like, I, one of the most important things about writing fiction is you have to feel a sense of freeness. Because if you think too much about the market or if about publication, all that kind of stuff, it's gonna block you. So I want you to just say, like, write a terrible story for me, six pages. I just gave you the theme, and I gave you the, it's, it's going to be three characters. After you finish writing this thing, most likely it's not going to be terrible, but most likely we're going to understand, oh, she feels more comfortable writing present tense sentences. She feels more comfortable writing stories that are set in Italy rather than Virginia, right? And then I'll kind of know what you're interested in. Maybe you might write about something from 2018, or maybe you might write about something from 1818. You're gonna know, because once you take away all the expectations, your work will show itself to you. And I really, that's again, an act of faith. I actually believe that it's happened. I've never seen that rule violated. So whenever I take the pressure off from students, they tend to produce work that's quite beautiful and meaningful to them. It can't be meaningful to me. It must be meaningful to you because once you create that thing, you're going to have to revise it. Because if you want it to be art, then, you, then the hard work begins. So there's a hand up over here. Hi, I'm Olivia Enos. I'm a graduate of Patrick Henry. Hello. I uh, just finished reading Pachinko, and it moved me beyond words. Um, oh, thank you. Honestly, it reminded me a lot of my other favorite book, which is Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. I love Dostoevsky. <laughs> we have the same birthday. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> but so does Leo DiCaprio and Demi Moore. Oh. <laughs> um, but I think that it really spoke to something true about humanity and about life in a similar way to Crime and Punishment, and that was why I sort of saw those parallels but there. But I didn't kill a landlady, though. Yeah. That is true. <laughs> um, I was curious if you could speak a little bit to the theme in Pachinko of women's suffering. That was really the start of uh, the novel and also the conclusion of it. Why did you choose to focus on women's suffering in particular, and does this tie in any way to sort of original sin, Adam and Eve, anything in that regard, or is it just completely separate from that? Oh, that's really interesting. I never, I never thought of it that way. I always thought the Adam and Eve story was really quite unfair. I do. I still think it is uh, unfair. I don't like it. Unfair to whom? I think it's really unfair to Eve. <laughs> and also, Adam looks like such a coward, right? He's kind of like, it was her. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was to be like, really? Really? That's the guy? <laughs> but then it's helpful. It's helpful to think of Adam being kind of a jerk and a coward, right? Because I'm thinking, well, that's the original dude, and he's a jerk and a coward, and he's going to blame his girlfriend. <laughs> just, just, just about all the biblical heroes are, right. are jerks and cowards. <laughs> that's true. That's really so. true. Um, so that's Adam and Eve. But no, I wasn't thinking of Adam and Eve, but I, I do think crime and punishment has always been an influence for me. I, I love Dostoevsky. I think he's so interesting. His sentences are not great. But of course, we are reading it in translation. Maybe in Russian, they're better. 
But I do think that his plot is fantastic. His themes are probably the mo one of the most laudable. So I like that a lot. But in terms of your question about women's suffering, the men suffer in this book enormously too. But it's explicit of the women's suffering in the sense that when I interviewed all these Korean women, they all kept on telling me, a woman's lot is to suffer, a woman's lot is to suffer. I mean, they just said it like day in, day out. And I was kind of like, I was so irritated by this. Because I'm modern, I live in America, I don't want to suffer all the time, I'm a feminist. And I think that I was trying to puzzle this out. At the same time, I will say this, is that now, having finished the book and having written how all these poor people suffer, I have come to the belief that in a way, to tell another person that suffering is coming is probably very good advice. Because I take umbrage, and I get in trouble for saying this. Uh, my first book, Free Food for Millionaires, is taught at Columbia. And every year, I go to Columbia, and I talk to these students who read Free Food for Millionaires. And the professor usually asks me, could you please tell the students your theory on happiness? And I go, oh, they're, they're really not going to like me. <laughs> because I always say, I don't believe in the pursuit of happiness. And the kids are like, oh my gosh, she's evil. <laughs> what is wrong with her? And I always tell them, I want you to be good. I want you to do the right thing. I want you to learn as much as you can. And happiness will come now and then. But the pursuit of it is making you miserable. The idea that everybody's always happy all the time, and if you're not, there's something wrong with you, is making so many of you miserable. So try to be decent. Like, if you can't be good, try to be just decent. <laughs> That's not a bad goal. And the kids always kind of like, <sighs> and, I, and I tell them, I think there's something really cruel about telling someone to be happy or to pursue happiness because there are seasons in your life when you're not going to be happy. It, it just, you're not. Like, people get sick. People, uh, people lose jobs. People get injured totally carelessly. I mean, to tell a student who went to park in the Parkland shooting recently, to tell a child to go be happy after this is just nothing short of insensitive and mean, right? Like all those children who witnessed this and all the parents and, and the people who've lost, like they have every right to be furious. They have every right to be grieving. And it may take a long time for them to heal. So. Suffering has come to them. It has come at their doorstep, totally unfairly, unexpectedly. And we have to be honest. So I think in that sense, I have come to the point of view from going, getting really angry at these women are like, I'm tired of you telling me to suffer. So now saying, no, I think these, they have something there. So trying to be decent and then having the hope or faith that it's going to work out, this is actually a very traditional... Presbyterian and Reformed way of looking at things. What is the chief end of man? Yeah. To, in case you don't decent. know, to, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Right. Right. So you know, so it's interesting to glorify God, but the, that's that's the primary thing. And then the second clause there is to enjoy Him forever in the hope and faith that that will actually come about. If you believe that. <laughs> okay. If you don't believe that, then it's really hard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and also sometimes you don't enjoy God. And I think there's a lot of evidence in the Bible where people aren't enjoying God at the moment. Right. They're throwing things at him. So, and you know what? I honor that too. I honor that idea that you could be angry with God. Yeah. He I think it. actually God honors it in the Bible when you're angry with him. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't zap Abraham for giving him some back talk and asking questions and so forth. I mean, I just think, I mean, I love the story of Job so much. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Because Job gets to do this. And yeah. Job is constantly saying things like, just, just curse me and let me die. And I think, yeah. sure, I would say that too. If I was covered in boils, sure. Like, okay. Well, well, help me out, because the, the most frequent uh, critical letter I get in editing world is if we have reviewed an R-rated movie and found redeeming social value in it, mm -hmm. or if we have reviewed a book to pull one out at random, uh, uh, Pachinko, 
let's say. And <laughs> and yet there are there are there are f bombs yes. in it. A lot. And, and so and so. The and there's sex. And there's sex. And the readers and say. Gay sex. And the readers say, no wait. Uh, why are you recommending to us hmm. a book with bad words and sex in it? And I've, I have my standard letters that I respond in with some, you know, uh, sleight of hand at times. But, but how would you respond to that? Well, I am a Presbyterian, and Presbyterians are probably the dullest, right, of the, <laughs> the Christians. The, the frozen chosen? <laughs> yeah, we're the frozen chosen. We're really uptight, and we don't have a whole lot of fun. However... <laughs> I think that we're textually pretty accurate. And one of the things I really like about the Bible is, um, you know, the Bible has incest. Yeah. The Bible has explicit sex. There's prostitution. There's illegitimacy. There's murder. There's rape. And in Jesus' Violence, family line. In Jesus' family line. And I do think that if you are a Christian and if you believe in God, and there's a lot of room for discussion, I, and I want there to be discussion, I, would, I think that we are of this world and we're not of this world. And if you are of this world, that you can't seal yourself off from everything that you disagree with. That does not promote democracy. I'm a big believer in democracy, and democracy means that I need to do business with people I disagree with. I need to hear people that I disagree with. So even though I am a New York liberal, you can call me whatever you want, and I probably believe in lots of things that very traditional Christians don't believe in. However, I am very willing to listen to them, and I hope that they're willing to listen to me, and I hope that we could do business, because we have to grow as a community. And America is a great country because it is a democracy in which people are allowed to say the things that we don't agree with. Yeah. Can I call you a Christian writer? Sure. I'm a Presbyterian writer. I'm also a feminist writer. I am. And people may not like that. Yeah. Questions? We have a couple minutes left. Hello. Thank you just again for coming and speaking with us today. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned earlier that in your early childhood, um, you read a lot of Korean fairy tales and Western fairy tales. Um, do you think that influenced your writing at all? And if so, how? Oh. I think it influenced my reading to the extent that I like knowing the fairy tales of every culture. So the fairy tales will tell you the important foundational myths of every community, right? So, for example, if you read Italian fairy tales, they'll be different than Korean fairy tales. Korean fairy tales, where you have central characters who are girls, very often focus on sacrifice, submission, silence. All those things are very important qualities for the virtuous girl. And knowing those things, I'm sure I internalized some of those values, and then as I became older, I had to actually resist some of those values and say, I don't agree with those things. And of course, coming to America, and again, I've been informed by American popular culture as well as American Western literature popular culture. So, so if you read Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, and if you read a Korean fairy tale, you're going to have different heroines and how they approach life. However, they're both virtuous in my mind. So I think that all that exposure has helped me to become, I guess, more of a global thinker. And I think that unfortunately or fortunately, what's happening with education in America, as well as in advanced economies, is we're having people who are becoming global citizens and all these other people are not. So all of us, when we're fortunate, we can have a more global education, and there's a whole world out there who's not getting that at all. So in a way, I feel very fortunate that I could be a global thinker, and everybody here is a global thinker, but there's an enormous number of people who, are, who feel left behind and who may feel resentful of the global culture. And to this, I feel terrible. I feel terrible about that. Yeah. Uh, now, when I read Tolkien, and I see the, the way God's providence suffuses his writing, mm -hmm. uh, sense of, of self-sacrifice, I mean, these are all 
things that I, my tendency is, well, of course he's a Christian writer. I mean, these are, these are things that are there. And so the same thing when I, read, when I read your two books. It seems to me pretty obvious. Yes, she's coming from a Christian understanding, a Christian worldview. And yet when I've, when I've read, and I may have missed these, I mean, I've read some reviews of your book, I don't see secular critics pushing back at you theologically, which surprises me in a way. Is it something that they just miss because they're not expecting it? Or do you think it's... Has, has any, have any secular critics actually criticized the implicit theology of your novels? Oh, very good. No. No, I, and I think it's because, if you think about it, secular critics are really well-versed in Western literature. And so much of great Western literature that I admire and I try to imitate in some ways have the same Judeo-Christian themes of redemption, of forgiveness. So it's not even like they need to push back because right. they think that's normal storytelling. I think that what people don't like is when you don't leave space in the text for any other answer. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of space in my work to disagree with me and to take other characters' points of view. Like you could say my worldview will be just like Hansu, who is a god lo lowercase g in the book. And I've met a lot of people like Hansu whose attitude is, and he's a gangster in the book, and he is very clever. He doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in government. He doesn't believe in really people. He believes in his own abilities. And that kind of person might be really attracted to some reader. Like, I've met several readers who've said to me, I love this character. And I love this character, too, as a fiction writer, because you can't have story without a strong villain. Villains are great. Yeah. <laughs> but when they're looking at this villain, they're seeing somebody who's really attractive. And my work has space for that. And, in, and I do think that if a writer is, has faith, so if a writer is, let's say, Jewish or Christian or Muslim or any other religious practice, does it show in their work? Probably, but I don't know if the readers want to see it. And maybe, in a way, the readers should have the right to choose what message that they get. Because they, they're going to come to you where, where they are. And you know, in a way, books always meet people where they are. And in a sense, writers who aren't Christians but they are well-read, they've read lots of other writers, are living off the interest to a certain extent, right? Oh, They're if you say the word redemption, you're, if you say the word soul, you are saying something that comes you know, very specifically from certain religious traditions. Right. And so I'm reviewing a book right now by an author, and the word soul is mentioned maybe like 60, 70 times. And I was trying to understand where she's coming from because... Buddhists actually deny the existence of a soul, and there certain some of her characters reject Christianity, and certain of her characters are Christian. And I was trying to figure out what is her point of view about the afterlife. So I've been wrestling with this idea, and I don't know what her background is. And in a way, I was kind of glad that I don't know. So it was very helpful to me to figure out. Okay, well, from the text itself, I will deduce this. But clearly, she is mindful of the fact that there are different ways of interpreting the idea of soul. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are out of time. Oh. But this has been great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Thank Minjin, you especially Martin. for coming. It's been great. <laughs> it's a pleasure.